Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for coming here in this early gray day. Uh, thank you, Tina, for inviting me. It's a big honor. Uh, I never gave a talk in the morning. Usually mornings are not my favorite time of the day. My brain is very slow. But I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I didn't expect so many people would come so early. Uh, so hopefully I'll do my best to uh, inspire you and entertain you. So I'm Ji Li, and it's, it's nice to meet you. I uh, work, uh, tomorrow is going to be my last day at uh, Google Creative Lab. I was there, I've been there for three years, been wonderful years, uh, and I'm switching codes, as Tina says. Uh, going to be working as a creative director at Facebook coming soon. Um, I have, I studied at Parson, um, before that, I come from Brazil, uh, and before that, I was born in Korea. Um, and uh, I have uh, been working as a designer uh, in design studios, and I switched to advertising. Uh, I've been doing lots of uh, uh, projects on my own. Uh, and today, um, I would like to focus on the importance for me personally of the personal projects. And specifically, I would like to talk about how personal projects uh, make me happy and lead to job I love. I uh, highlighted this end. Uh, it's a typographic uh, uh, crime to italicize and underline. But uh, I, I wanted to highlight that because for most of us, I think uh, we tend to separate professional projects and personal projects. And, and that's what I was doing in the beginning of my career, too. I thought these two things didn't go really well. Uh, and I was always shy to talk about my personal projects uh, at workplace. And uh, I think this is something, talking to other designers and other creatives, this is something that I also hear, is that they have their job to make money, and then they have their personal side thing, which is something really passionate about in, in their life. You know, maybe they have painting projects, maybe they work in a soup kitchen, maybe they have design projects. But people don't seem to mix these two worlds very well. Uh, and in fact, I think a lot of us tend to separate this world really and, and, um, and uh, keep it really separate. But I think there is an opportunity to uh, to bring this world together, and it's it's not an easy task. It's a it's a very uh, frail balance that uh, I have been maintaining in the last 15 years uh, since I started working and doing my project. But I think it's possible, and when that happens, I think there's something really awesome, you know, uh, because you can bring the wonderful things that uh, you know, passion and uh, my personal vision into the professional world and things that I learned from professional world of. Uh, scaling things and collaborating with other people into my personal projects. So I would like to share some of these personal projects I've been doing since I graduated. And a lot of this project actually started when I was at school. Uh, and school, you know, was the best time because I could just do whatever I wanted to do. There was no really restrictions, there was no clients, and it was a total freedom. And I really worked hard and I had lots of fun working on this projects, and uh, I kept doing lots of this project that I started uh, at school until now, and this is one of the uh, examples of this, the project that I started while I was at, still at Parsons. This probably was the, the first typography class uh, assignment that uh, my teacher, Charles Nix, gave to the class, and it's one of those classic um, you know, Cooper Union typography, Herb Lubalin type of uh, project where you can only take, take elements within a word, typographic element, and, and uh, make an image out of it. So here is an, an, you know, here is an example, idea, elevator, 
So no extra, extra element can be added. Diet. Election. <coughs> Moon. Gravity. Tsunami. Ill. Clock. Men's room. Sometimes it's very literal. And uh, Van Gogh. And I call this also insomnia project because whenever I have a hard time falling asleep, um, I start to think about these words. And I've been thinking about these words for the past 15 years. And uh, it's really kind of a fun game that I play with myself when I get bored um, and go on. Memory. And I have collected about hundreds of these now. And uh, I recently found a publisher, uh, Pingin, uh, liked this project and wants to publish as a book. And so it's what started as a, you know, sophomore topography class really became my lifelong uh, project of passion. And it's nice to somehow put it all together into a book. It's very rewarding. Uh, the next project is called Universe Revolve, a 3D alphabet. Again, this was a, a school project. Uh, was given at the, uh, the first um, uh, 3D program course at Parsons, and it was done by, uh, you know, the program was Adobe Dimension that doesn't exist anymore. It was a very crude 3D program, and I was experimenting. Uh, and the idea behind this 3D alphabet or font is at the furthest left point of each letter, you draw an axis, a vertical axis, and around this axis, you rotate the letters until they become three-dimensional shapes. There you go. And then you have the A to Z. Uh, you have the punctuations. And uh, I like the question mark that you can see over there. It looks like a, a light bulb, a question mark that's a light bulb. I think it's very interesting. Um, and now that these letters are three-dimensional, they can become objects. They can uh, you know, set in motion, we can made in, you know, into chocolate candies, and it opens lots of different possibilities of reading and writing and experimenting. Um, so I'd like to challenge if somebody can read this. Anyone? Reading is fun, there we go, yes, reading is fun indeed. And it brings a uh, little bit of the, the joy that we, as a child, learned A, B, C's, and A for apple, B for boat, C for candies. And it, it brings us the, the inner childhood uh, and uh, rediscovering the alphabet letters, which I think is, we tend to take a lot of things for granted. And this gives a, invites us to rethink the letters in a different way, in a three-dimensional way. Here is a uh, Humpty Dumpty set on a wall. And uh, Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. And you know, here I'm experimenting with, with stacking the letters. Uh, here is a, a palindrome, which you can read in both directions. It's, this is one of my favorite palindromes of all time. Uh, it says, I saw, I was I. Here it says, wake up. And uh, this entire city is made up of uh, 3D letters, and you can actually read every element in this, uh, in this picture. So you can read casino, hotel, police, generators, robots, and every part of the robot you can also spell like arm and lasers and so on. So um, I spent three months uh, doing this. You know, none of this was done in like the shading and all this stuff was not done in the 3D program. I drew an illustrator. And I sh created a shadow in Photoshop, which was the stupidest thing. I could have probably learn the 3D program. <laughs> just apply the, the light and just boom. Like instead, I had to create everything separately. Um, so at the time, uh, you know, I graduated. And um, I was working uh, the first two years in, you know, between corporate uh, design jobs, doing annual reports, and creating 
logos and stuff, and then I, jumped, I went into a smaller uh, design studio uh, called Sang Seymour Design, and doing lots of uh, brochures and catalog for museum. These are some of the examples of the books that I was working. Uh, and um, I really liked the job. I love typography, I love editorial. But I wanted to do something a little bit more conceptual. And um, I didn't really know uh, where to go or, or, or how to make that happen. I was interested in the idea of going to advertising agency because advertising deals with pure concept. And I was really uh, interested in, in trying that out at least. And it's really funny how things just happen in life that you don't really expect. And sometimes something just come along that uh, opens a whole new door. So this 3D alphabet that I was working uh, as a student uh, was part of my portfolio. And then I went to see different people to find a freelance job. And I, one of the people that I went to see was uh, Abbott Miller at uh, Design Writing Research. He is now, I think, partner at the Pentagram. But he had a small studio doing uh, brochures and uh, other uh, academic works, and he wrote uh, with uh, Ellen Lupton. And he interviewed me, and he saw 3D Alphabet. He was really interested in because at the time, he published a book called uh, Dimensional Typography, which I think some of you may be familiar. It's a kind of a seminal book now. And um, because of the 3D Alphabet in my portfolio, he hired me, and you know I was working there. And when the book came out, um, New York, uh, one of the New York Times reporters saw the, the book and the font and asked me to, uh, to, to, you know, asked me if they can use the, the uh, 3D font, and that was published in the New York Times. And one thing led to another that took me to change of job, and this is how it happened. Started with a school project, and then I got a job with design writing research. Met Abel Miller's Dimensional Typography, and that was published there. New York Times, and that was uh, published in the New York Times Magazine article, which was seen by Laurie Anderson, who was a judge at the uh, World, Changing, World Changing Ideas Award at Saatchi and Saatchi. Then that got included as a part of the finalist at the Saatchi uh, Award. Through this experience, I met Bob Isherwood, who was a worldwide DCD of Saatchi, who then offered me a job at Saatchi and Saatchi. So, um, I would have never imagined this project would lead me to a job uh, at an advertising agency. Uh, this is something that I really wanted to do. So it's, uh, and I keep seeing that over and over again of the project that I worked on, the bubble project, the, the 3D alphabet or abstractor that somehow facilitates me through finding these jobs that I love and makes me happy by doing these things. So the bubble project was, uh, Another example. So when I came to Saatchi, I, I loved the job. I loved the idea of com, you know, coming up with concept and creating big uh, TV campaigns and so on. But quickly I realized that the, uh, um, the process was not really that creative because everything was getting tested. Clients were very conservative. And people were just, in general, afraid of trying new ideas. So for four years I was, was working at Saatchi, I wasn't really able to produce anything. I think I produced one TV spot for Head and Shoulder, which I wasn't really proud of because everything got modified and tested. And uh, I was uh, deeply frustrated. Uh, it wasn't really the idea of conceptual advertising that I was thinking before I came to, uh, into the advertising. And more and more, um, I was actually being, uh, I was becoming not only frustrated but ashamed of the work that was getting produced from the agency and other agencies that uh, filled every space of uh, public space in the city that I loved. And I really wanted to do something about this. And I also wanted to produce something because I wasn't able to produce anything for the four years, so I wanted to do something on my own. So I took $3,000 uh, from my own money and produced 50 stickers and put the stickers all around the, the city. And um, uh, it became a big success, and I would like to share a little video of, uh, do we have sound here? Or oh, maybe the, the video is not working. Sorry. I have to go back. This is a little... I'll, ju I'll just hack the... 
Finally, from us, the bubble project splattered across magazines, flying across the TV screen, popping up on the computer. The average American is exposed to some 150 ads every single day. ABC's Bill Blakemore has the story of one man who has found a way to use those ads to make art. He does it by harnessing the creativity of the people, and it's catching on. Here's Bill's report. He calls it the bubble project. It's illegal. Uh, whenever I see an ad, I bubble the ad. A lot of people come to me and they ask me what I'm going to write on it, and I said, nothing. What are you going to write on it? He wants the public to speak, and they do. Sometimes it's political comical. What country would Jesus bomb? Or the revolution will be outsourced. Sometimes it's social psychological. Why think about your life when you can watch us? Movie reviews. Why do I make such stupid movies? Or sometimes cinematic philosophical comical. Desperately seeking purpose, says Gollum in Lord of the Rings. There's now a book called Talk Back with a map showing all the countries that bubbling has spread to through the Internet. And there are also people who have started their own bubble project, uh, ProgettoBolla.com from Italy. He got bored working in an ad agency. So I wanted to come up with a simple device that would transform these boring ads that we see. And the idea struck, and that was the uh, talk bubble sticker. But it's risky. We cannot tell you his name. I've gotten a few tickets. I am mostly very cooperative, and I, uh, I promise I'll never do it again. I think I'll bubble a little doggy here. So I'm going to put another bubble right here to this guy. We're going to give her a voice. What would you write? Bill Blakemore, ABC News, New York. Needless to say, that gentleman was in disguise because it is graffiti, and what he's doing is illegal, but the responses are rather interesting. So, um, bubble pro what Bubble Project really taught me was that I don't really need account people or clients or even money. I can just do everything, you know, planning, production, uh, spreading, everything on my own. And uh, that really gave me the sense of empowerment because in the beginning I had no idea what's, what's going to happen. I'm just going to put some stickers and let people write something inside and let's see what happens. Uh, but then that completely exploded. All of a sudden, lots of people were doing their own versions of Bubble Project and it went around the world. And it really made me see the personal project in a whole different level. So it's not like doing something private in particular. I can actually have an impact in the world. And uh, so that was really, uh, really encouraging to me to keep doing more projects like that. And it's because of the Bubble Project, um, you know, at the time, as I was being frustrated and such, I wanted to try perhaps more uh, boutique smaller agency. And at the time, Droga 5 was opening its store. Um, and Droga 5 is considered one of the hottest agencies now. And uh, I really wanted to work with David Droga, who was you know, one of the most uh, awarded creatives in the ad industry. And the, I got the job uh, at Droga 5 because of the Bubble Project. It wasn't because of the uh, uh, head and shoulder commercial I made at Saatchi and Saatchi. Um, uh, and so again, how this pers personal project helped me find a job in a place that I like was a big lesson for me. And here, this is the, uh, the project that I worked on when I was at Droga 5. And you can see some of the similarities uh, from the bubble project into this uh, project, which was uh, a real client project. Uh, New Museum was the client, and uh, they were opening their doors with this incredible building on Bowery Street, and they wanted uh, to have a, a launch campaign. And we pitched our idea. Uh, it was a very simple idea of taking the silhouette of the building and applying this everywhere in, uh, in all medium on all media that uh, uh, we communicated. So we made die cuts, uh, uh, posters, and put it right on top of existing posters, and that became an ad. And the whole idea was seeing through the lens of new museum from this building, 
you could see things in a different perspective, which is sort of the filter of our institution and art that through the, uh, the die cut of New Museum, you'd see something one day in a slightly different angle. We also made uh, uh, the subway domination. These are stickers that creates illusion of space behind, but it's really a sticker that uh, we applied on top of uh, walls. Here's another example. <coughs> Put uh, on top of uh, bus advertising. Now, you know, the morning news with the anchors, typical advertising, you can now focus on the beautiful curl of one of the announcers. We also made the, uh, the bicycle uh, in the shape of uh, the building and locked it around the city. And it's really interesting to see people's uh, reaction. This guy <laughs> is, <clears throat> is really, really, really puzzled about this. And I love these moments of magic when you, know, you create something and you put it out there and somebody is stopping for, I don't know, three or five seconds. And because of that piece, this person is really thinking. And that's it's such a rewarding moment when that happens. There is another bicycle. Uh, and we uh, work with Calvin Klein, um, billboard. Is this is one on Houston, the famous, usually controversial Calvin Klein billboard. And we dripped uh, pink paint over the billboard on the course of uh, I think a couple of weeks. Uh, this generated lots of uh, talks around the city, like who is doing this. Blogs and magazines started to talk about it, which is the best form of advertising when others are talking about uh, your project or your client. And then in the end, we revealed the, the message, which is the opening uh, of the new museum. Um, so you can see the relationship between the Bubble Project and the new museum. They're both dealing with hijacking existing media, uh, dealing with messaging in the, in the street level. And it really, these two projects really complement each other. I couldn't have done new museum without having going through the experience of doing the Bubble Project. So again, how these two professional and the personal world can come together and create something really awesome. Uh, and then I do a bunch of other projects. You know, I, at any given point, you know, I have my full-time job. At any given point, I have probably about uh, six to 10 projects that are happening at the same time. My side projects, some are, are really short-term, some of the long-term, some of the you know, medium-term. And uh, this is one of the quick ones that I did through uh, uh, New York Street Advertising Takeover. Um, building 3D chessboard. Uh, making installation, upside down installation on the ceilings. This is in the house of a friend. So I get commissions to do this fun installation now because of this installing uh, Duchamp bicycle wheels on the streets. It's just for fun, you know. Um, designing a clock. And <clears throat> this is a, uh, my latest project that I worked on with a couple of friends, Daniele Codega, who's sitting here, and the programmer who is uh, uh, and also another friend. We just, I just love movies, and I wanted to, to create a game uh, using these movies. You know, such as you have to guess which uh, object this movie is from, which famous object, uh, this, you know, from which classic movie this famous object come from. So it's a hangman style game where you have to type in and then it reveals the right answer. So like this one is obviously E.T. This is maybe a little harder, Memento. Train spotting. Clockwork Orange. And there are about uh, 120 of these um, uh, posters. And we had launched this project about a month ago, and we had uh, 1 million unique visitors, and I think about 30 million page views, which reveals that it's a really, really addictive game. People are, cannot uh, leave the game. But it's, again, it's, we didn't expect, you know, we thought maybe a few thousand people would come, but uh, it was a total surprise that so many people came, and through this uh, experience, we met also a lot of people and people making suggestions about the movie. It's really fun, rewarding 
experience when there's so many people who are, uh, you know, coming to see the project and exchanging ideas and giving suggestions. Um, North by Northwest. And I, I love uh, other designers who are doing uh, their personal project. Tina, obviously, is doing so many personal projects, creative mornings, and she has a full-time job, but then she's developing all kinds of different stuff, and she has two kids, but still she manages to do awesome things. Justin Dignag, One for Sale, is one of my favorite projects where he draws things that uh, he wants, and then he sells his drawing by the price of the thing. So like he'll draw a sneaker, and the price of that drawing is the price of the sneaker. And so he drew a trip to Las Vegas, and then somebody paid for his trip to Las Vegas. And you know, dinner at Noble, somebody paid for the dinner at Noble. It's what a great idea, right? So it's a win-win it's a situation, and he keeps adding this stuff. Um, and he has a bunch of other side projects, too. And he is a full-time uh, uh, creative in an ad agency. So it is possible to maintain this two worlds and have this world comp complement each other. Brooke Davis makes something cool every day project. I think is an, an awesome project where uh, you can see this in the Behance.net. Um, he dr just created one project a day for a full year. So there are 365 pieces that he created every day. And you know, it's just so simple idea but really uh, forces you to create something every day. And it's, it's just fantastic. Uh, they're very different, and uh, it's emotional. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's weird. Uh, and Christoph Neiman, one of my uh, dear friends and my heroes, is, I think, the perfect embodiment of how this personal and, and the professional world can come together. I mean, he's... Uh, abstract Sunday, where he does uh, all different kinds of illustrations and thoughts. You know, you're probably familiar with the uh, I Lego New York, and then the Google Maps series. These are his personal vision and personal interests. And uh, through this personal uh, project, he's able to publish in the New York Times and gather, you know, lots of lots of uh, fans, and and then that becomes a book project. So, what a wonderful way of combining this two worlds. So just to wrap things up, I would like to share with you five things I learned uh, thus far doing personal projects. So it's really all about having fun. Um, I'm doing these projects because I just want to have fun doing this project. It's not because I want to make money. It's not because I have to feel good about myself. It's, it's just having fun. And when it's, when it's fun, I can always find time for it. That's one thing that I keep hearing from, you know, uh, other people say, how do you find time? Like, I'm so tired after food, you know, my, my job, I want to come home and just watch some TV and go to bed on the weekends, I'm also really tired. Like, how do you find time? And I think the secret is that, uh, you know, when you're having fun, you can always find time for it. Like, you never, you always have time to go out and have a drink with, your, uh, with a friend, and that's because it's fun, and it's the same thing with the personal projects point that I, I think uh, stressed uh, a lot through uh, this talk is the personal and professional, uh, they really complement each other. Um, and um, that's one big lesson I learned uh, throughout these years. And, um, and I, something that I also tell my employee before I, I get hired, that I do this personal project and uh, I don't want to be uh, I, I don't want to feel bad about doing, doing this thing because I think they can enhance my professional uh, job. And they usually understand and they also encourage for me to keep doing this, which is great. To never put all my eggs into one basket. This goes to, in terms of jobs, uh, I don't want to depend on my boss. I don't want to depend on a company or a brand because who knows what's going to happen to that company tomorrow. I can only rely on myself, and, uh, and also it comes with the project. I don't want to put all my energy into one project. What, ha what happens if it doesn't go so well? So if it doesn't go so well, I have other projects to fall on. So to spread, to, di to di diversify uh, all the projects I'm working on, I think it's a really important thing. Uh, work on many projects at the same time. Uh, this is huge. Ideas are nothing. Doing is everything. Uh, Working in a creative field, I 
find lots of creatives who love to talk about ideas. I have this idea for a book. I have this idea to open this kind of place. I have this idea to make a film. Uh, talking about it is great, but it's nothing until you actually make it happen. So doing is, is everything. And in the end, to quote uh, Seth, uh, ship, ship, ship. Um, this is really important just to make something and just get it out there. If it works, it's fine. And if it doesn't work, that's also fine. And I had lots of failure as many times as I had uh, success with my project. So shipping fast and as often as possible is something really important that I learned. So that's the end of uh, the presentation. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Tina. <laughs>
and then all of a sudden that becomes viral. And it's like, I have no idea why this was sitting for two years and nobody paid attention, but then why is this happening now? So it's, it's so random, you know. So it's, for, I think it's like 50-50. Some, half of the project really takes off, half of the projects don't, and that's fine. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, this is um, something I'm doing more and more is, um, because I see the reward of collaboration. Um, because I used to just work on my own stuff because I thought it was easy. Like, I've, I'm everything, I can do everything on my own. But I see more and more of my own limitations. Like, as I work on web-related projects, I cannot program. You know, I'm not a programmer. And, um, and I'm not really a great UI designer, for instance. So I'm working on a couple of projects right now that are uh, collaborative. So a couple of people are actually sitting here. Um, I'm working on uh, a tool, uh, a web tool that I'm developing with a few friends, front end uh, developer, back end developer, two UI designers. And it's really, it's really rewarding because they bring their passion and enthusiasm. I bring my passion and enthusiasm. And, Projects live or die because of great collaboration. If I have a bad collaboration, then it's over. If I have a great collaboration with good people that I can trust, then it really can take off. So I love uh, to do collaborative uh, projects together with the right people and friends. Yes. if anything suffers in my personal life because I'm too busy doing personal projects? Is that the question? <clears throat> well, I think, um, I think it's quite the opposite. Um, I, I'm very restless. Um, I'm also uh, impatient. Uh, I think I have addictive personality. And uh, so if I didn't work on the personal project, I'd probably be a drug addict uh, you know, miserable, de manic, depressive person. Uh, really, this personal project saved me because I'm doing something healthy and positive and working with my mind and creating something. So it really it enhances my life and it, it really saved me from killing myself and self-destroying. So it, it, it's, the, it's the cure for me. Yes. So the question is, uh, what is the process I go through to create something like? What is, it, what are, is there a formula or is there a, a way I, if I sketch things? And I, there is really no process or no formula. I don't, like a lot of great creatives have a sketchbook and uh, I don't even have that. And it's really, I think one of the things that uh, uh, I do as a, like a play is to constantly observe thing and think about different ways of seeing the same thing. So like there's a, you know, the street art is huge in New York right now. So every space is being claimed. Like the back of the stop, board, stop signs, there's like stickers all over the place and walls and everything is taken. So I try to think about, okay, what are the spaces that are not taken? Uh, maybe the sidewalk on the side. Nobody has ever done anything on that space, so maybe that's the space to claim. Nobody has done a lot of work on the ceiling space, that's just that empty space. Nobody has, I mean, people don't really tend to put things on the back of their business car, so that's space to explore. So I try to look at uh, unexplored places, and I also try to, I like to play games all the time, so, for instance, uh, right after 9-11, I realized there were lots of uh, logos with a cityscape that contained uh, the Twin Towers. And it was very sort of mixed feelings that I had because I was sad, but I was at the same time happy to see this, you know, typical uh, cityscape logo with the Twin Towers. So I started to collect these uh, logos and I photographed them, and it became... It's, it's, it became a game. Like whenever I went onto the street, I would look for 
something like this. And there's always something like a back of a truck or you know, in a laundromat we have this logo. So it just, it becomes a game for me and it's, it's fun to go out on the street and bicycle looking for this logo of the World Trade Center. So I think the formula is to making something into a game. Like the word as image is a game for me. When I have insomnia, I play this game. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the question is uh, if I ever lose steam doing my projects, if I get stuck sometimes, or um, if I lose interest, what do I do? That's why um, not putting all my eggs into one basket works well for me, is to always work on several projects at the same time. I think right now I have probably about eight projects that I'm working on, and there are, some of them are like long-term projects, like a book projects that I'm thinking. Um, so we, if that happens, you know, if I get stuck or if I lose interest, I just put it aside, and uh, maybe I don't come back in a couple of months or even years, and then something maybe strike, and then I'll, I'll go back to that project. So and may, sometimes I never go back, but um, it's, it's the importance of having many projects working at the same time that's, that works for me because I can jump back and forth between projects. Question, yeah? The last one. Yeah, one of, one of the favorite projects I'm working on right now is uh, this collaborative process project that I mentioned. There's a couple of people here sitting. Uh, we're developing a, uh, a web tool. I, don't, I cannot tell you exactly what it is, but uh, uh, my, ultimately, my ultimate goal is to become independent. I mean, I love working for great companies because I learn a lot uh, in these uh, companies and I love the people that I work with, uh, collaborations. But ultimately, I'd like to um, become independent and do my own thing. And um, this project is part of that exercise, you know. Um, I want to be able to develop something that uh, a lot of people end up using and hopefully that will become monetizable, which hopefully can bring independence. So that's, uh, it's, it's this web tool that I'm, I'm developing with a few friends. That's my favorite project uh, right now. Thank you. Thank you.